Change is inevitable in the course of human civilization, however, there are always people in any given society who seem intent on preventing change to the way society is organized. Whether such people benefit from the existence of the status quo, or just fear that change will bring instability. But there are also those who see the existing social order as far from optimal, and thus desire change. To both groups a question which is of great interest, albeit for different reasons, is how society changes, or in other words, what factors contribute to the way society organizes itself. In this lecture we are going to examine the views of the 20th century philosopher and economist Ludwig von Mises on the issue of societal change. Mises was someone who certainly favored change in his time. Being born in the Austro-Hungarian Empire in 1881, Mises observed firsthand the destruction brought about by the rise of socialism and the totalitarian governments it spawned throughout Europe and Asia. In fact, Hitler's rise to power in the 1930s forced Mises to flee Europe for America, as he was not only a well-known Jewish intellectual, but also one of the staunchest critics of Hitler's National Socialism, and all brands of socialism for that matter. When addressing the question of change in human history, philosophers and historians have often viewed the role played by the individual in shaping the course of events as virtually non-existent. Instead, many have adhered to what is called a philosophy of history, that being, a theory which attempts to discern an underlying general pattern in the course of historical events. Instead of change being brought about by the actions of individuals, those who make use of such theories see these patterns as evidence that the course of history is being guided by some form of superhuman entity. There is not a single philosophy of history, but rather a variety of them. Different philosophers and historians have observed different patterns in the course of human history and made use of different entities to explain these patterns. For example, those of a religious bent often saw a god directing human affairs through divine providence. However, in Mises' day, the philosophy of history put forth by the famous socialist Karl Marx was especially influential. Marx proposed that the course of history was driven by an impersonal force he called, but never clearly defined, the material productive forces of society, and this force would lead to a period he called the end of history. At the end of history all the trouble, suffering, and wars that afflict the human race will cease, and humans will then live their days in a communist utopia. Mises had no sympathy for such speculations, and instead based much of his analysis of social phenomena on what he saw as a self-evident truth, which is referred to as the action axiom. The action axiom simply states that individual humans act, or in other words, they use means to achieve their desired ends or goals. While such a statement may seem somewhat trivial, Mises believed that one could unpack a great deal of insight from the action axiom, for understanding social phenomena. It is important to make clear that when Mises spoke of human action, he was not referring to what could be called automatic reactions or involuntary responses, such as the reaction caused when one touches something hot. Rather, human action was purposeful behavior, and for him it was this behavior which shaped the course of human history. As he wrote, History is the record of human actions. It establishes the fact that men, inspired by definite ideas, made definite judgments of value, chose definite ends, and resorted to definite means in order to attain the ends chosen. Most people will certainly agree that human action, as Mises defined it, influences the course of human history. However, where Mises differed from many of his contemporaries, was that while he did not deny the possibility of some superhuman entity influencing human action, he thought that because we really have no way of knowing if such a thing exists, that the furthest back we are warranted to trace the cause of human action is to the ideas which engender them. Furthermore, Mises believed that if enough people come to adopt the view that human action, and thus the course of history, is directed by a phenomenon outside their control, they are likely to feel powerless and ineffectual at bringing about change, and rather, will see themselves as puppets in the great march of history. 
Instead of viewing men as mere puppets, Mises believed that if people came to the realization that ideas inspire action, and action shapes the course of human history, then they could also hold out the hope that individuals could help create societal change. For as long as one believes that people's minds can be changed, then there is always the possibility that through education and the spreading of ideas, one can help bring about change. But Mises was quick to warn that the ability to change society through ideas could lead to negative or destructive change just as easily as it could lead to positive change. To Mises, the structure of society was largely determined by ideology, or in other words, the ideas one holds concerning social organization and how individuals should conduct themselves. The majority of people spend little time forming their own opinion, let alone ideologies, and instead adopt the ones put forth by those who are viewed as the intellectual leaders of a society. But if the so-called leaders propound spurious ideologies, due to their desire to maintain power, obtain wealth, or just because of plain ignorance, society will ultimately suffer. The masses to Mises were not only largely passive in the development of ideologies, but also in the development of ideas in other fields be it science, technology, philosophy, or literature. And this led Mises to emphasize the essential role that individual innovators, or what he called creative geniuses, play in shaping the course of human history. Or as he says in Theory and History, Most people are common men. They do not have thoughts of their own. They are only receptive. They do not create new ideas. They repeat what they have heard and imitate what they have seen. What produces change is new ideas and actions guided by them. These innovations are not accomplished by a group mind. They are always the achievements of individuals. The integral role played in the course of human history by these creative geniuses was for Mises yet another sign pointing to the absolute importance of individual freedom. When individual freedoms are limited and more stress is placed on conforming and contributing to the so-called good of society, the chance of an individual making a creative contribution to the path of mankind will greatly diminish. In addition to individual freedom, Mises also emphasized that in order to promote the flourishing levels of creativity, which lead to positive change, a society must have a smooth functioning economic system so that it may produce adequate amounts of wealth. While many philosophers certainly agree with the importance of individual freedoms in fostering creativity, there are few who stress the importance of wealth. In fact, many look down on the creation of wealth. However, as an economist, Mises was not naive to the fact that if most people are constantly worrying about where they are going to get their next meal, it is unlikely they will put much effort into philosophizing, developing innovative technologies, composing music, writing books, or engaging in scientific experiments. And to conclude this lecture, we will quote Mises on this issue of the importance of wealth in fostering creativity. All that society can achieve in these fields is to provide an environment which does not put insurmountable obstacles in the way of genius, and makes the common man free enough from material concerns to become interested in things other than mere breadwinning. The foremost social means of making man more human is to fight poverty. Wisdom and science and the arts thrive better in a world of affluence than among needy peoples.